Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Daniel. I am the new lead pastor here at Redemption Church. Would love to meet you after the service and get to know you a little bit better. And uh, yeah, just really looking forward to opening up God's word today as we're in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, what better way to start our reflection on the Sermon on the Mount with the words of the late, great Dallas Willard. Anyone familiar with Dallas Willard wrote that beautiful book called The Divine Conspiracy? And this is what Dallas Willard once said about the Sermon on the Mount. He said, the aim of the sermon, forcefully indicated by its concluding verses, is to help people come to hopeful and realistic terms with their lives here on earth by clarifying in concrete terms the nature of the kingdom into which they are now invited by Jesus' call. Repent for the life in the kingdom of heavens is now one of your options. The separate parts of the discourse are to be interpreted in light of this single purpose. They are not to be read as one disconnected statement after another. One must discern the overall plan of life within which the separate parts of the discourse make sense. Within which the separate parts of the discourse make sense. Now, I know that's a pretty lengthy statement and you don't usually start a sermon with a quote like that one. But I want you to keep this in mind as we look into Jesus' teaching today on Matthew chapter 7, verse, verses 7 to 12. Let me read our scripture passage today. Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Let me pray. So Jesus, we come before you today wanting to be good students of your word, knowing, Jesus, that your word never returns void. And so Jesus, we pray that uh, all of the things that we have learned thus far in this sermon, we pray, Jesus, that you would just take us even deeper into an encounter with you and your goodness and your grace. We know that your words here are immensely wise And we know that oftentimes there are a lot of interpretive possibilities. But we pray, Jesus, that all of those interpretive possibilities would lead us to the place, again, of encounter with you, Jesus. That we might be transformed. Lord, that we would be confident of what it means to live in your kingdom. So we pray this, Lord, that you would just saturate this place with the the presence of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come, brood over us. Bring us into an encounter a revelation of just how beautiful you are, Jesus. I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so if I were to ask you the question, which I am right now, I'm asking you the question, what's the main topic that Jesus is preaching on in this section of the sermon? What is this really about? Ask, seek, and knock. Anyone? What's it about? What's the main theme? No one wants to answer. Anyone? Just take a stab at it. Faith, prayer, persistence in prayer, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Faith, someone said faith, absolutely. Given our text today, right, we oftentimes think about Jesus' teaching here to be about prayer. I would say most of us would look at this teaching and say, oh, yeah, obviously this is about praying to God for our needs and being persistent about praying to God for the things that we need. So here's, the, here's, here's an issue that I have, is that I was unboxing some boxes this week of books, and uh, I was looking through the boxes that I brought from Calgary, and I pulled out The Divine Conspiracy by Dallas Willard, and I was like, oh, Dallas Willard, you're, you were so wise. What do you have to say about our section of scripture today? And this is what Dallas Willard said. He said, the ask, seek, knock teaching first applies to our approach to others, not to prayer to God. And I read that statement and I was like, those are fighting words, Willard. How dare you? I was like, Willard, I love you, man, but that's just going too far. Because if you've been in church for any length of time, 
How many times have we heard sermons on ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you, preached completely in the context of petitioning our heavenly Father for our daily needs? We've heard a lot of sermons on that, haven't we? So I had to sit with Willard this week because he was, he is and was much smarter than I am, okay? So I wasn't like, you don't know what you're talking about, Willard. I was basically like, okay, I'm gonna sit with this this week and just begin to think about what Willard was pointing towards. And I would say, first, is that it's only natural for us to assume that ask, seek, knock teaching is about prayer. And the reason why that we often think about this is Jesus' teaching about how to pray is because this is how the Gospel of Luke frames Jesus' teaching on asking, seeking, and knocking. In Luke chapter 11, the disciples see Jesus praying in a solitude place. And one of the disciples asks that question, Lord, Teach us to pray, and what does Jesus do? Starting in verse two, he gives them a blueprint for how to pray, and it's what we know as the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And if you're King James oriented, you end it with, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever, amen. And then so Jesus teaches the disciples what we call the Lord's Prayer, but then immediately after the Lord's Prayer, have you ever noticed he tells a story immediately after this about a person needing daily bread? About a person needing bread. Jesus knows the human heart, doesn't he? He knows that when we hear teachings like this on this is how you're to pray, that oftentimes our hearts zero in on the very thing that applies to us. So we're like, okay, but like Jesus, the prayer is great, but what about the bread part? I wanna know more about this bread that you wanna give me. Does anyone remember high school? High school when at the end of the year you received your yearbook at the end of the year. What's the very first thing that you did when you cracked open that yearbook? That's exactly what you did, right? You look for your own image, right? You don't go to the staff page and you're like, Lord, bless every individual on this staff page. Bless my teachers. Like, you're not praying intercessory prayers, reading through the yearbook from beginning to end. You go to the end, you find your name, and then you flip through to find out where you are in this book. Anyone? Yes, absolutely, right? We, we tend to be self-absorbed, right? So when we hear Jesus' prayer and the Lord's prayer, give us this day our daily bread, we're like, oh yeah, the prayer is great, Jesus, but tell me more about the bread. And so Jesus teaches the prayer and then he jumps immediately, preemptively, without even the disciples asking a story about daily bread. How the Father desires to meet your needs. And listen to the story again in Luke 11. So after the Lord's Prayer, Jesus then says to them, suppose you have a friend And you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up to give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you, right? This is our text in Matthew. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So of course, it's only natural for us to jump to that assumption that asking, seeking, and knocking is about prayer. It's only natural, given how Luke organized Jesus' teaching, for us to conclude that we're supposed to understand this in the context of prayer. But then why? Why would someone as intelligent as Dallas Willard and even one of my personal favorite preachers of all time, Martin Lloyd-Jones, I'm like, 
MLJ, you're, you're with Willard on this too? Why would they say, ask, seek, knock, is first and foremost to teach us something about how we are to treat one another in Jesus' kingdom? Why would they say something so confounding as that? Now this church has been going through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, since September of last year. I've been checking the live streams. And the only practical way to do a series this long is to, for us to divide, to divide up Jesus' teaching into these palatable, bite-sized like morsels, right? To teach on the sermon in little bits and sections, little portions at a time until we get to the end of the series. Because if I were to read three chapters to you and then say, okay, now let me expand and expound on this, we would be here for months and none of you would ever get back, come back, right? I'd be able to lock the doors. We're not gonna be done until we're done the three chapters today. But as I was watching your previous live streams, I noticed that in the very introduction to this series, Pastor Chris very brilliantly brought up readers from the children's ministry to read the entire sermon from beginning to end. That's how you started this series, reading it, listening to it from beginning all the way to the end. And I would say that's a brilliant move because that's how we're supposed to take in Jesus' teaching here. Like Dallas Willard says in my quote in the beginning, the separate parts of the discourse are to be interpreted in light of a single purpose. That is to give us a sanctified imagination for what life in Jesus' kingdom is truly like. And I would suggest that when we read the Sermon on the Mount and think about the sermon in these beautiful but bite-sized disconnected chunks, there's always the danger that we begin to think that Jesus is just throwing out random and disconnected statements of how the world is supposed to operate. And if we think about the sermon in this overly compartmentalized way, it's easy to envision Jesus as a Messiah who's just chaotically just shifting gears all the time as he's preaching because the sermon kind of feels like that at times, doesn't it? Just jumping from unrelated topic to another. So for example, from last week to this week, Jesus would be like, don't judge, you got a log in your face, don't give Bibles to dogs, don't give pearls to pigs, oh, and be persistent in your prayers, God likes it when you pray fervently, ask, seek, and knock, and, and like some of you are giving stones to your kids when they ask for bread, don't do that, God doesn't do that. And what else, what else? Oh, 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 I got one. Um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And I guess that's my question today. This is what I wrestled with. Are we supposed to reflect on asking, seeking, and knocking, and then the golden rule as beautiful but disconnected topics? Is that how we're supposed to understand the sermon? And so today, I want to suggest that the asking, seeking, knocking teaching is is it about prayer? I do think so, yes it is. But I also wanna suggest, like with Dallas Willard, it has something profound to say to us about how we treat one another in God's kingdom. So notice the literary structure. I like that you put that up already. It's, it's really, I know it's really bright. I added green, it's St. Patrick's Day. Um, I also have a green hanky, so no one pinch me, okay, okay. I, got, I brought something green. So let's talk about the literary, literary structure. In order to do that, um, I need to include last week's teaching on judgment. So take a look at, at a minute. You don't have to read it. Just take a look at how these two sections, these two units of teaching are organized. Because we often think about them in a separated way, don't we? Right? So just, you know, just kind of look at the colors, right? And you notice that the structure of Jesus' teaching between judging others and then transitioning to asking, seeking, and knocking, do you notice that they're actually kind of mirrored in their teaching, in their structure? Matthew 7, verse one to two, judge not lest ye be judged. Jesus makes this, he starts off with a declarative statement and then follows it up with an expansion on that declarative statement, right? For the measure you use it, it will be measured unto you. Matthew 7, verse seven, our text today, ask, uh, ask, seek, and knock, right? Ask and it will be given, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened. And then he again expands on that declarative statement and he says, everyone who asks will receive. Everyone who seeks will find. Everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. And then in the green section, notice, he then goes into an illustration, right? The first illustration is about logs in your eyes and specks in other people's eyes. 
And in the ask, seek, knock section, he dives into an illustration about how fathers, even if they're evil or flawed, know how to give good gifts to their kids, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? And then both sections end with what feels like a disconnected proverbial statement. Isn't that interesting, right? He's like, don't give to dogs what is holy, don't throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you, and then our section today ends with another proverbial-like statement, the golden rule. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So we can see here the two units of teaching are mirrored, aren't they? Just in their structure, not in their content. Now let's look at the content. So we looked at what we looked at last week. Judge not lest ye be judged that teaching on logs and specks in people's eyes. What is that teaching really all about? It's really, if if we think about it, it's really about how fallen humanity often treats one another. It's about the operating system of a fallen and broken world where we all tend to have arrogance towards others and ignorance towards our own shortcomings, where we're quick to dismiss people and write them off entirely. But what is the ask, seek, knock illustration and teaching really all about? And I would contend it's about the operating system of the kingdom of heaven. The central character in Jesus' illustration isn't the evil father who sometimes gives good gifts. The central character is your heavenly father who has made a settled decision to have his heart filled with goodness towards his people always. And because his heart is filled with so much good towards us, he, all, he gives us this now, this open invitation to his kids. He's like, you can always ask. You can always seek. You can always knock on the door. It's never an intrusion upon me. Listen to the words of Scott McKnight on this section. Scott McKnight said, Many of us were taught that the three verbs ask, seek, knock were present imperatives, which means we are to persist and not give up. Ask and keep on asking. And if we kept on asking, kept on seeking, and kept on knocking, God would hear us. And now, though that's not necessarily wrong, I think there's something about persistence in prayer, but listen to Scott McKnight's warning. If we are not careful with this persistence theme, we create a God who seems to be either tired or busy or perhaps uninterested, but persistence might stir his attention. Is this the point that Jesus is actually trying to convey to us? The whole point of asking, seeking, and knocking It's often described and explained as sort of this escalation in seriousness. It's like if you ask and you don't receive, then seek. And if you don't find, then knock on the door until you receive that blessing from your heavenly father. So is that the central meaning behind ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking and knock and keep on knocking? It's about us proving somehow to God just how serious, persevering, and resilient we are in praying for the things that we need. Now, some of you might be, at, might be saying right now, but it does seem kind of like the point, doesn't it? Asking, seeking, and knocking, given the illustration that Jesus gives in Luke chapter 11 about a friend knocking on your door at midnight, needing a place to crash, and you don't have even the most basic level of hospitality to offer them, like your storehouse is empty, you don't have any bread in the pantry, and so what do you do? You go to your neighbor's house, asking, seeking, knocking for the bread that you need for your hungry, tired friend in need who has knocked on your door at midnight. But your neighbor, your neighbor's asleep and he's kind of crabby. He's like, go away, I already set the alarm. My kids are asleep. But what does Jesus say? Luke 11 verse eight. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your, let's say it together, shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. I love those words. Shameless audacity. It's only in the NIV. It's your shameless audacity that's gonna open that door for the need that you have for your friend. The neighbor will give in. They'll give you the bread that you need. And it's not because of your friendship, but rather in the Greek, it's because of your anidian, shameless audacity. This is a fascinating 
compound word in the Greek. It's a double negative, and it's only used once ever in the scriptures, and it's in this story. So the two words, Anna, it means without. Ideo, it means not looking or downcast eyes. When, when you're ashamed, you don't look at people in the eyes. You look downcast. So literally translated, an idean, shameless audacity, literally translated means without not seeing. That's weird. <laughs> without not seeing. It's a double negative, right? It's a strange double negative. Literally, without not seeing. So does it mean that you can't see? How do double negatives work? No, it means the opposite. It means that you can truly see. In the words of Susie Silk, an idean is a true seeing and a true knowing that leads to boldness. And that's the point of asking, seeking, and knocking. Do we truly see, do we truly know our heavenly Father's heart towards his kids? Because if we do, there should be no hesitation in asking, seeking, and knocking. The point of Jesus' story in Luke 11 is that your heavenly father is not like your sleeping, irritable neighbor who doesn't want to be bothered at night. We can ask, we can seek, we can knock with shameless audacity. Why? Because we know the heart of the person we are asking We know the heart of the person that we're seeking. We know the heart of the person on whose door we're knocking upon. The person in Jesus' illustration knocks and bothers his neighbor. Why? Why does he bother his neighbor in Jesus' story? It's because he knows, he can see, he knows that his neighbor has what he needs, the bread. He's like, listen, I'm knocking on your door. I know I'm bothering you. But listen, you're a baker. This is a bakery, okay? You have bread in here. I know you have it. Give me what I need for my friend. So he does see, and so he can knock with boldness. But Jesus is not saying that your heavenly father is aloof and asleep to your needs. He's, it doesn't, he's not saying that God is like, don't bother me. I already, I'm already tucked in at night. The point of the story is to remind us again who you're dealing with. God is your father. Of course you can ask. Of course you can seek. Of course you can knock. Karl Barth said it like this. He said, in the beginning, before time and space, as we know them, before creation, before there was any reality distinct from God, which could be the object of the love of God or the setting of his acts of freedom, God anticipated and determined within himself. This is the point to pay attention to. He anticipated and determined with himself in the power of his love and freedom and of his knowing and willing that the goal and meaning of all his dealings with the as yet non-existent universe should be the fact that in his son, he would be gracious toward man, uniting himself with him. Even before the foundation of this world was set, God makes a decision that in his son, he's always going to be kind towards his creation, heart filled with goodness towards humanity. Your heavenly father has determined before the foundation of the world that because of Jesus, he's made a settled decision in his heart to be gracious towards you. He doesn't operate towards us with the measuring stick that we often operate with. To the measure you use it, the measure it'll be given to you. He's not like that. I love how Arnold used that verse about the measuring and it's spilling over. This is God's heart towards you. Yes, he's holy. Yes, he's righteous. Yes, he's just. Yes, he's not a pushover and he grieves over what sin has done to his good world, but his heart disproportionately leans towards unmerited mercy in all his dealings with his kids. This is the good news. This is the gospel. The gospel declares that it's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus It's through the life, death, death, and resurrection of Jesus that you and I can be made right before God, forgiven, accepted, brought into his family. The story of the gospel declares that God has moved heaven and earth in Jesus so that there would be no irreconcilable differences between you and him. 
The gospel declares that in Jesus, God has reconciled us to himself and that we have sinned against God, we've offended God, we've hurt God, that we've violated God's law and yet God in his hurt and in his offense has come after us with mercy and love and grace and brought us back to himself through Jesus. And through Jesus, God is forgiving us and he's renewing us and we come, as we come under the gracious rule and reign of his son, Jesus. Paul says it like this, we've not been given a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we've been given a spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. This is what the gospel declares. Because of Jesus, you and I are brought back into relationship with God and are having our lives renewed and healed under the gracious rule and reign of Jesus but it's not simply that I'm, I'm made right before God and you're made right before God and how we treat each other doesn't change. There's this horizontal dimension to our salvation, isn't there? Jesus wants to heal, restore, and reconcile all human relationships. God wants the sin that separates us, the sin that hurts us, the sin that embitters us, the sin that angers us, he wants those sins to be forgiven, no matter how deep they are, no matter how repetitive those sins might be. To be people who live in forgiveness, to forgive others who've wronged us, to forgive others who've hurt us, who've offended us, who've violated us, who've victimized us, to actually extend forgiveness to them in the same manner that the Father has extended forgiveness to us. This is what the kingdom of God is like. It's about forgiveness, it's about reconciliation, it's about us being made right with God, but this being made right with God also extends to being made right with one another so that we live in a kingdom where love indeed does cover a multitude of sins. Paul says in Ephesians 2.12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant promises, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ, you who once were far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. See, vertical dimension. In Christ, you once who were far off, separated from Christ, what? You've been brought near to God. Horizontal dimension of our salvation. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility that exists between all people, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female. Now notice in our text again, as I, as I move towards a conclusion, okay? Jesus says in verse 11, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So, therefore, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and prophets. And I would say it's from this vantage point that everything gets clearer and clearer for us that we gain greater clarity for what Jesus means by the golden rule. This isn't some disconnected proverbial statement that Jesus kind of throws in because it sounds good. I don't know about you, but some of the reasons why the golden rule oftentimes feels perplexing to me is that I oftentimes have no idea how I want to or desire to be treated in certain situations. It's only after the fact that I know. Anyone with me? You have an interaction and then you leave that interaction and you're like, I don't like how I was treated there. It's only after the fact that we know. The other part of the golden rule that's often perplexing is how I desire to be treated isn't always the way that others desire to be treated. You're like, hey, I got you a burrito. I filled it full of jalapenos because I like spicy things and that's how I would want it, so therefore that's how you would want it, right? Golden rule, done. And you're like, I'm actually allergic to jalapenos. And you're like, eat those jalapenos. Don't waste them. <laughs> the golden rule can often sound like this preemptive, like, if I scratch your back, please, please scratch my back in return. This is kind of like paying it forward, hoping that goodness will return into your life. And I would say, I don't think that that's what Jesus is saying. 
It's not this separate statement that's disconnected from the discourse that he's talking about. Because Jesus starts the golden rule with those words, therefore, in light of all of this, and what's he referring to? He's referring to seeing and knowing and experiencing God's heart, his love, and unmerited mercy towards us. In light of that, in light of the fact that your father is the good father who gives good gifts to his kids, he does not want us, he does not give us what we deserve, he gives us what we need. And it's from this well, the well of the father's love, this storehouse, the storehouse of God's mercy and grace towards us that we begin to look towards others with the same posture and attitude as our good heavenly Father. Thank you, Father. For Christians, the golden rule is centered on seeing and knowing that our heavenly Father has already given us the greatest gift. He's already poured it out for us. Our deepest longings, our deepest desires on how we long to be treated, the deepest aches that we feel God has accomplished already for us in the person of Jesus. This is what the gospel declares, that Jesus looked out to our interests even above his own interests, that Jesus went broke to enrich us. He would lose and be brought low so that we would be lifted up. He would be condemned so that we could be forgiven. He would be cast out so that we could be brought in. He would be separated from the Father and made an enemy of God so that we, the actual enemies of God, could become friends of God and brought into his family and counted as sons and daughters of this good Father. So as I close, I want to share one story with you. I want to tell you the story about a woman named Mary Johnson In 1993, Mary Johnson lost her only son who was shot four times in a gang-related altercation. Her only son. And the police arrested a suspect, a 16-year-old named O'Shea Israel. And over the next two years, he was tried, he was found guilty, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. And at the trial, Mary Johnson, who was a good Christian woman, told O'Shea at the trial that she forgave him. Because that's what you do as Christians, right? But in her heart, she hated him and saw him as an animal. And she said, I'm a Christian, so I have to forgive. But deep in her heart, she still hated him. And for 10 years, she went on with bitterness, anger, resentment in her heart. And then in 2004, her pastor asked her to teach a Bible study on forgiveness. Now, that's a great strategy, right, pastors? (laughs) You find the greediest person in the church, and you're like, hey, can you teach a Bible study on generosity? That'd be a good idea, that's a good idea. And here her pastor asked her to teach a Bible study on forgiveness and through the process of compiling these studies together, she began to be convicted about her hatred and anger towards the man who shot her son. And she felt God calling her in repentance because of her bitterness and she began to pray for the man who shot her son. In 2005, a year later, she arranged a meeting with O'Shea in prison where she told him that for the first time, truly from her heart, she forgave him. And he asked her, ma'am, how can you possibly do that? And her answer was, because of God's work in me, because of his forgiveness to me, because of his love to me. And that day he looked at her and he wanted to express somehow his appreciation for her kindness to him. And he asked her if he could give her a hug. And when she hugged him, she collapsed and she fell and, she, and he held her up in that moment and she said in that moment she felt all the resentment, all the anger left her life. And she began to visit him regularly in prison and they developed an actual friendship. In 2010, O'Shea was released from prison and Mary had prepared a homecoming party for him. Mary's friends and family all gathered together and they welcomed him in. And O'Shea was absolutely amazed at the people whom he had caused so much hurt and so much pain that they had actually forgiven him and welcomed him into their family. Now here's the beautiful thing. Today, O'Shea lives next door to Mary. And they enjoy a deep friendship and she's become like a mother to him. And they travel around the country talking about the power of forgiveness and love. Is this not the kingdom of Jesus? This is the kingdom of what, of, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Yes. And this is what your heavenly father is like. This is what his heart is like towards you 
always. And it's from this vantage point, I'm gonna invite Ashish to come up. It's from this vantage point of God's sacrificial love graciously given to us in the person of Jesus that we begin to do unto others. It's from that vantage point. What God did for us, we then lavishly pour out on those around us. Let me pray for us to that end. Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for your word today. And I pray, Jesus, that if there are relational barbs that exist in this room right now, if there are things, irreconcilable differences, we pray, Jesus, that it wouldn't be that we leave and we would just say, I should do better, I should be better, but that Jesus, those, those areas where we feel like our hearts are made of stone, we pray, Jesus, that first and foremost, we would again experience the limitless dimensions of your love for us, towards us. And that would be out of receiving your love, God, that we begin to look upon others in our lives and to think about how we can love and serve them well. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.